Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Masood Kandakar, and I am a, an assistant professor of medicine and a fellow in the Division of Cardiovascular Disease at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'll be talking about uh, a paper that will be published in the Cardiovascular Symposium in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in June 2010 entitled Pericardial Disease, Diagnosis and Management. So pericardial disease, interestingly, was one of the uh, first known medical patholo pathological conditions that was identified. It was actually first described by physicians approximately 400 years ago. Yet we continue to have difficulty in diagnosing and managing the various pericardial syndromes. I think it's extremely important for the primary care physician to be aware of how to diagnose and manage pericardial disease because it can be life-threatening in certain situations and can carry a significant morbidity. So the four major pericardial syndromes uh, include acute pericarditis, relapsing pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, and constrictive pericarditis. So the first pericardial syndrome I'd like to talk about is acute pericarditis. Now the diagnosis of, has been challenging for acute pericarditis because it's often uh, difficult to differentiate this from myocardial infarction. Now while there's no current guidelines in the AHA and ACC on the diagnosis of acute pericarditis, we would recommend uh, the following. If the patient has two of the following four features, that would include uh, chest pain, that's typical of acute pericarditis, ECG changes that are typical, and these do include diffuse upsloping, uh, ST elevation, and PR depression, a pericardial uh, friction rub, and a new or worsening pericardial uh, effusion. Now, if the clinician is <coughs> confident with their diagnosis of uh, acute pericarditis based on these four criteria, cl the clinician would next need to decide should I hospitalize this patient or not. Now, if the clinician is not confident with the diagnosis, another option would be to obtain a cardiac MRI and look for delayed enhancement uh, gadolinium uptake. And this does represent uh, pericardial inflammation. And if this is positive, the diagnosis of uh, acute pericarditis can be made. Now, who would I hospitalize? The patients that I would hospitalize are those with high-risk features. And some of these high-risk features do include uh, fever, leukocytosis, patients who are hemodynamically unstable, patients who have a large pericardial effusion, patients who have not responded well to uh, NSAID therapy, and patients who have had recurrent uh, pericarditis. So if you decide to hospitalize this patient, the next step would be to decide which patient is stable and which patient is unstable. If the patient is stable during their hospitalization, they can be observed and treated medically. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, a emergent echocardiogram should be obtained. If the echocardiogram does show features of cardiac tamponade, the patient uh, should have an emergent pericardiosynthesis to drain that pericardial fluid. Now, if the patient is stable enough to be treated as an outpatient, there are uh, various options that can be used. We have used NSAIDs, colchicine, and corticosteroids generally for the treatment of uh, acute pericarditis. Now, NSAIDs and colchicine have been shown to be highly effective. Now, colchicine should not be used on those patients who have uh, renal failure, liver failure, or motility disorders, and it can also cause diarrhea, and the patient should be uh, aware of this. While corticosteroids have been widely used for the treatment of pericardial disease and acute pericarditis, the major problem with corticosteroids is patients, once they are tapered off of corticosteroids, 
often have relapses, and this does cause significant mor morbidity. Corticosteroids, however, are very effective in relieving uh, the chest pain and symptoms of acute pericarditis. However, we would generally recommend that corticosteroids are reserved for those patients who have an underlying connective tissue disorder that's causing the acute pericarditis, for patients who have failed NSAIDs and colchicine, and for patients who have contraindications to uh, NSAIDs and colchicine. The underlying condition causing acute pericarditis should be treated first, and this does include neoplasms, uremia, myocardial infarction, acute aortic dissection. And once these have been treated, further management can be considered. So the second thing I'd like to talk about is relapsing pericarditis. And relapsing pericarditis is very similar to acute pericarditis. Uh, however, patients have relapse of their pericardial inf inflammation causing chest pain. So to diagnose uh, relapsing pericarditis, all patients must have a chest pain. And in addition to chest pain, uh, other features to look for include fever, pericardial friction rub, ECG changes that are similar to what you get in acute pericarditis, and elevations in white blood cell count, CRP, and ESR. Pericardial effusions can also occur in relapsing pericarditis. Now, if the clinician is still uh, uncertain about the diagnosis of relapsing pericarditis, other diagnostic modalities do include uh, cardiac CT and cardiac MRI. Again, cardiac CT would show uh, pericardial thickening. And cardiac MRI can be especially useful because, again, it can show uh, evidence of pericardial inflammation through delayed uh, enhancement of uh, gadolinium uptake. Now the treatment of relapsing pericarditis is actually very similar to acute pericarditis. Uh, I would also use uh, NSAIDs and colchicine as first line. And these can be used from anywhere from a week to a month to several months depending on how the patient uh, responds clinically. Again, corticosteroids are widely used for the treatment of relapsing pericarditis, and in some studies it's been shown to be used uh, from 60 to 90 percent of patients. Again, the problem with corticosteroids is the fact that once these patients are tapered off their corticosteroids, they often relapse and have recurrent symptoms. So again, I would recommend that corticosteroids be reserved for patients who have had treatment failure with NSAIDs and colgicine or have underlying conditions such as connective tissue diseases uh, which have caused the relapse. Now one of the problems that we often see here is patients who have been on corticosteroids for a long time and they were started initially for their acute pericarditis and now we can't really taper them off it. And my suggestion would be that in these patients corticosteroids should be tapered very slowly possibly even at one milligram per week over several months. And this is to try and prevent relapse in these patients. Now in patients who have had medical uh, treatment failure, these patients I would consider a pericardiectomy. However, these should be considered at uh, highly specialized surgical centers that perform pericardiectomies uh, fairly frequently. Uh, the problem with the pericardiectomy is it does carry a high operative mortality of approximately 5%. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.